Witness away to church and raise it, remake him. Good morning. So tonight is a full moon, full moon practice, and Dirk is very generously a leading uh, practice again. <clears throat> um, it is important to coordinate our um, training with um, lunar cycles and um, cycles in general, right? So one reason I've advocated us practicing Kala Chakra Tantra Yoga because um, it's important to notice these cycles, like breath cycle, right? <laughs> um, seasonal cycle, and thing happens in these cycles and to harmonize with them. So I'm um, really glad Dirk is doing that tonight. Thank you. Where is he? There he is. Okay. So <clears throat> then, um, uh, you know, many people have asked me, you know, like, how do I continue my Mahamudra Dzogchen practice after retreat? And I say, please read uh, Ganji Upadesa, uh, you know, Patra Rinpoche, um, uh, uh, sometimes it's it's important to listen, you know. So because of wonderful electronic devices, we have uh, recordings of um, uh, Dujim Rinpoche still, right, on uh, YouTube. So um, Patty was reminding me she's watching these, and um, uh, you know that sometimes we we just need that kind of personal, <laughs> even though. Uh, many of you didn't meet Dujim Rinpoche in, um, even in his most recent uh, incarnation, he recently, second time passed away, <laughs> but the YouTubes are very good. Um, people want to continue to have the view, so recommend that highly. <clears throat> okay, so let's do prayers. <clears throat> All right, so seven line prayer of Guru Rinpoche.
Chanji Lokshu Seksu So Guru Kama Siri Teacher, O Destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, Endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O Destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, O Destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, Gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, O destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, Helms them of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O Destroyer, Glorious Victorious One, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, Chief of Humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, Supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like a stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, Omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity from, from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abided in the fear of trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all free, ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, to Supreme Faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and cloud, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all seen, and thereby subduing the enemy of fault, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by waves of aging sickness and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness in the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free of suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. 
I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning of this time and rejoice in my virtuous actions of ordinary and fortune. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam guru ratna mandala kamriyatayam. Give a moment for the little Buddhas to exit. Part of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, Bhagavan was dwelling on massive Ultra's mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomenon called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avadukateshvara looked upon the very practice of profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avadukateshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avadukateshvara said this to the venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form. No feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach beyond the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment and reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection is, is declared Payata, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasom Gate, Bodhi, Soha.
Ayata, gate, gate, pergate, per songate, bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avarokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the venerable Shaivadi Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avarokiteshvara, and those surrounding in their entirety, along with the word of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. I'm on. I'm on now. Uh, okay. Actually. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, good. That's for teaching. Yeah. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches. Okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> you know, Yoda was wrong. Trying counts. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Rinpoche used to say, it, it, it is the effort that counts, right? It's the effort, bodhicitta. So, um, delighted to see you all here today. Dear, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, one of uh, Tibet's most famous yogis, Machik Lavrung, female yogi from the uh, 11th century. <clears throat> the Heart Sutra that we just um, read out uh, it's difficult to understand, right? How do we put it into practice? Machi Lam Zheng, she was someone who uh, devised actually a tantric practice uh, to put it into practice. And that was called Chu, or cutting off, cutting off delusion. <clears throat> so I, I want to talk a little bit about her today. So we have one, one other little Buddha going. I hope so, right? Yeah, good. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we don't have a, a uh, Tanka of um, Machik uh, here. Um, she had many names. This is kind of like formal name, like, um, you know, like a single mother light of Dharma, like that. But you know, she had many names, just like we all have different names, right? <clears throat> She is uh, considered like an emanation of Yeshi Sogyo, uh, uh, who we talked about, um, I've done practice around, <clears throat> who appeared in her form during the same time as uh, Gurimshe. <clears throat> so uh, it's kind of like an esoteric side, but uh, sometimes. Um, in the Vajrayana tradition, we, we say incarnation, and sometimes we say emanation, right? So that can be confusing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, for now, uh, it's just best, to, whatever term we use, it's best to see that that uh, person is carrying on uh, enlightened activities and qualities um, of uh, whoever. So, um, for example, like with Tara, uh, we wouldn't probably say like someone's an incarnation of Tara, we might say an emanation, right? So um, I think that makes it easier because uh, sometimes you think reincarnation, then we get all kind of hung up on the truth or falsity or science of it. But if we um, see the sense that someone uh, is so vibrant and alive that uh, 
we can see them as carrying on um, uh, the qualities and the inspiration, and, and we use the, word, use the word like emanation, like that. <clears throat> or it would, it would be just like, like meeting that person. So that's the way I felt about my um, new teacher. For a long time, when I was young, I used to think, oh, I, I wish I could just meet Jesus, you know? Because um, <laughs> I went to Sunday school and you'd hear a lot about Jesus, but okay, how do you meet Jesus? And they said, well, you can't meet Jesus, you know, um, in the flesh, but, you know, I kept wishing. Uh, but then, you know, after doing a lot of practice, and I was also thinking, well, if I could just met Shakyamuni Buddha at Siddhartha, that would have been so cool. Um, but at some point, you know, after studying with my teacher for a while and maturing a little bit, then I said, I, I'm meeting the Buddha, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to time travel, right? I, mean, I didn't miss out, right? You know, because a lot of times people go, I wish I had been there then, you know, missed out. So um, with uh, Machik, you know, people at the time said, wow, we, we didn't miss Yeshe Tsogyo, we didn't miss out, you know, her same qualities are here. So that's high praise, right? And the feeling of like, well, it's all still alive, it's all still right here. It isn't like something died out and we wish they were here. No, still present. So that's the Mahamudu Dzogchen part, is that when we're talking about Machik Lambun's life um, in the tradition, uh, she's still present, right? That's a feeling of still present presence, you might say. Mm -hmm. So even though her uh, historical life was maybe, you know, middle of the 11th century to the middle of the 12th century. She lived apparently to be like 99. It's, uh, uh, Yeshe Soga lived to quite old too. So um, it is possible to live quite old. We're hoping um, Dalai Lama, uh, present Dalai Lama uh, uh, lives quite elderly. And I'm hoping I live quite elderly because I need the time to practice. <laughs> Keep an eye on you guys. <laughs> like that. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Machik uh, had many uh, difficult um, practice times um, uh, establishing herself as a legitimate practitioner, not only in the society. Um, being, uh, you know, free of um, traditional uh, obligations to her family, um, but also had to establish herself as um, an authentic Dharma teacher. <clears throat> um, that, that's difficult uh, when you kind of come from nowhere. It's reasonable to be skeptical of people. Even now we need discrimination, right? Just somebody says, I'm great. You know, we should, we should check them out, right? But, um, people were enthusiastic about her um, and uh, her uh, activities and her fame, if you will, spread so far that um, uh, Buddhists and uh, Indian Buddhists and Bogaya became curious. Right? It was still still Buddhism and Bodhgaya at that time, the Muslim invasions, Turkish invasions hadn't completely wiped it out. And uh, 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 masters from um, Bodhgaya said, hey, you know, we've never heard of anything really coming out of Tibet. Because of course, Padmasambhava came from India, went to Tibet. And, um, this is a new practice we've, we've never heard of. So, um, the story is they actually um, journeyed and, and uh, she didn't go to India. They actually journeyed and uh, interviewed her and said, oh, this is authentic. This is, this person knows what they're doing. It was quite interesting, right? You know, um, you know maybe, maybe we feel like, well, somebody should just self-authenticate. But um, it's nice when you get, um, uh, you know, uh, confirmation from your peers and from people that have some discrimination, right? Um, even though in a sense, maybe we don't really need it. Um, maybe it's just acclamation, 
but um, for Dharma to prosper, we, we like we like to check each other out, right? So uh, we're open to that. The Buddha was open to dialogue. So uh, Magic could have just said, I, I, you guys are a typical idiot, man. I don't want to meet with you. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was really interesting because that was a real meeting of um, um, the masters from India and masters from Tibet. Very interesting time. Just like during Padmasambhava and Yeshe Sogil's time, there was real um, interaction. Just like there was some real interaction. Um, we, Marpa went down to um, work with Naropa. But kind of after this period of time, a little scholarly, there, there wasn't much, you know, just uh, the invasions and you know, no one was going to Tibet. And, you know, kind of from, you know, 13th century on until 1950, um, was, you know, it was kind of Tibet was just doing their own thing. And now we've seen what happened. So we have interaction again. So I'd like to point out that Macho um, uh, was uh, very key in bringing people together like that. It takes a lot of uh, uh, guts for to be interviewed, right? You know, we usually think, okay, how do I, how do you, how do you do a Dharma interview? <laughs> Well, it, it isn't all um, formal Dharma debate, right? It isn't like um, um, formal, like, you know, do you know what these terms mean? Or there's a special handshake to show that you've realized Mahamudra. <laughs> um, uh, there's, you know, there's, uh, you, you have to spend some time around someone. So, uh, and you, you can't, uh, you know, you, you can't just, you know, check a box. So that's why I like to have a small number of uh, dedicated students, actually, because unless I'm meeting with people regularly, you don't know whether they're really integrating Dharma into their daily lives or not, right? They could say, I'm, I did this retreat, I got, I got this impairment, I received these teachings and long, long lists. Sometimes you can go on the internet and you see like extensive I did this i did this i did this I, that counts for something right uh, but um it, it's not until you you know personally meet with someone and and see where they're coming from to to really see right we, we have to check things out so i like i think that uh it's absolutely necessary for to have that close dialogue, right? So the truth comes out in dialogue, basically. Um, and that the only way to do that is to actually have it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, as a woman, she had to have that dialogue a lot. People would have questioned her a lot, just like yeah, she's so good, like, how do you know you know what you're doing? And um, just like the Buddha, you know, she um, she was willing to do that. <clears throat> The chip practice um, is not something I want to start right away, but talking about her, talking about it is laying groundwork. It, it's like a combination of uh, Prajna Paramita, uh, like we were reading today, uh, Mahamudra and Tantra. <clears throat> and one of the distinctive um, forms of chip practice is, is people um, would um, go to cemeteries or charnel grounds and uh, and sit there, you know, in, in scary places, right? So one of Machik's phrases is, you know, uh, go to the places that scare you, right? That's like, isn't that one of um, Pema Children's title to one of her books, right? You know, approach people you feel disgusting, you know, go, you know, go, go to these hopeless places. <clears throat> uh, I like to say we, we don't always need to do that here. Um, because we have a scary place, it's called getting with together with others at Donna Darkie Temple. <laughs> Everybody's personality issues are in full blown, you know. So, uh, the, you know, the opportunity to work with your delusions and fears is right here. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, 
you know, in, in kind of real time, uh, sometimes it does, uh, you know, help to go to scary places. Um, you know, so some people have done retreats in, in um, fairly difficult places. Um, Roshi Bernie Glassman, who I knew um, after studying at UCLA, Zen Center in LA, um, found his uh, Zen Peacemaker, Peacemaker's Order, and uh, he did these kind of homeless uh, session, you know, like sleeping on the park bench and, and sitting outside. And, um, you know, he had some encounters, right? So you know, those, those are things that, um, you know, uh, you know, can be kind of scary, right? There, are, there, are, there are actual physical scary things, but uh, most of it is um, right up here. Right? <laughs> so, um, in the chip practice, we we go to places that scare us and actually invite uh, the scary thoughts or invite the, the demons in, right? We're quite um, aware that the demons we're talking about are not outside demons. We we call them demons, but they're um, habitual mind patterns and very intrusive mind patterns that um, that find that don't seem to go away with traditional um, practices, right? That don't seem to go away with just letting them go or just being patient, which is huge, right? Usually in contemporary um, meditation, um, particularly you know, Vipassana style, spirit rock style, you know, just be calm and let them go, right? Sometimes that's all we need, and that's very good teaching, right? Shamatha and you know, non-attachment, very important. But um, extremely strong emotions, extremely strong um, impulses, uh, don't always respond to just let it go. <clears throat> or, um, you know, uh, just stop it <laughs> like that. Um, so, uh, what's interesting about the practice that she developed, um, which has similarities in other practices, would she would uh, visualize imaginatively um, offering her whole body and mind uh, to the demons, right? And do this in a form where um, she would visualize a, a bikini that would uh, come with a chopper, right? And then chop, chop, and then go into a skull cup and then you're boiled, and then you're offered, right? <clears throat> Sounds like a little self-cannibalism, something like that. <laughs> um, so, of course, this is imaginative, you know, um, uh, but um, when, it's, uh, when it's connected deeply with our emotions and our body, then uh, it doesn't become like a heady trip, like just get over it or just let it go. A lot of times that's very superficial. It's good cognitive behavioral therapy, but um, there's something that comes with the idea of real offering and um, real dismemberment, if you will. These are shamanic practices, of course, too, that some people may be familiar with. Um, so some people like um, Chogyal Namkai Norba, who I studied Chud with, have said that, you know, Chud also has that aspect of bone in shamanism and also um, but uh, the idea of actually um, willingly offering self up and uh, you know, giving up like that can be extremely powerful. Uh, contemporary um, Western teacher, uh, uh, Lama Sotrim in Taramandala in Pagosa Springs, um, uh, you know, is recognized as a uh, emanation of Machik, um, which is great. Um, she's written a few books. Um, one, not the most recent one, but one that has to do with true practice is called uh, Feeding Your Demons. Maybe someone's read Feeding Your Demons. Um, uh, so uh, her, her style is um, to combine a little bit of uh, like Jungian psychology with Dharma things, which uh, I do too sometimes, but uh, um, Jung had a really different approach than Buddhism for us actually in the profession. Um, so it, it can be uh, a tricky marriage, but uh, 
she tries to simplify the church practice to uh, finding out what our demons really need instead of really what they want. So on a, you know, kind of, you know, it's a, it's a nice way of kind of uh, making it simple a little bit. So uh, it, that becomes useful for us dealing with our daily lives, uh, dealing with addictions. So um, when I really want some, you know, uh, really nice flowers, chocolate cake, um, uh, is there something, you know, not, which I'm not eating, by the way, right now. So do what I really need, do I really need love, right? So instead of just wanting to have some kind of sugar high to leave current situation, um, what, what's the real need behind what seems or could be insatiable wants? So this is an important distinction in all levels of our practice uh, because uh, we may not be able to meet all our wants, but uh, you know, uh, somewhat to quote Mick Jagger, we, we may still get what we need, right? <laughs> I don't know, I had to throw, any Stones fans here? Yeah, so, uh, so um, you know, so the hand is up from, does that mean there's, there's a fire in the building or there's a question? A question. Okay, I'm I'm almost ready for questions. Oh. Just give me like. <clears throat> uh, Maji talked about uh, you know four demons, right? Which we should <clears throat> excuse me recognize. Uh, first one, the demon that blocks the senses. <clears throat> this is the demon that. We're very familiar with how we objectify people and things, right? We, we don't see our experience as um, uh, appreciative. We see it as, as very uh, subject object style, right? Then the second demon is the demon that cannot be controlled. <laughs> we should all know that one. That's our uncontrollable thought monkey mind, right? Demon that can't be controlled. Third is the demon of pleasure. Um, that's wanting, you know, uh, to have the whole chocolate cake, uh, knowing that in a half an hour we'll have incredible crash. <laughs> it usually goes along with, well, it's someone's party, so it's okay. Then finally, the fourth one, demon of ego. So that that is really uh, the demon that keeps us stuck, and there's a real sense of self and other. <clears throat> so you can see that um, uh, the practice um, is really going after these core uh, Dharma truths um, and has solid foundation in Dharma, even though we're, we're, we're doing kind of fantastic things with um, uh, two-sided drum. And kind of, it's good kind of um, uh, exercise for uh, probably uh, Maybe I should start doing for dementia or something because you're doing boom, 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 ring bell, and then also sometimes blowing thigh bone trumpet, right? All at the same time. And in between, with different chub practices, you might be doing Prajaparamita mantra or something directly with magic. But in any case, you're, you're generally always like boom, 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 doing this, doing bell at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh that's kind of it's kind of it feels great you know you, usually usually you're not doing prayer will when you're doing chip practice yeah just chip practice. but prayer will also takes you know that that's tougher than it looks greg brought up prayer wheel and you always think well, that's a piece of cake you know but but actually this, this one teacher um that does a lot of um uh, work with Parawil Garchin Rimshe in Arizona and uh, my friend Lama Grissom, you know, so uh, sometimes Parawils are really long, so you can kind of rest it on the ground, but also sometimes really, so you'll find out right away if you lose some concentration. Yeah, that's good, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, Parawils, you know, do they need to be oiled or not, you know, that's a question. There's, 
There was someone that actually made, they may still do it, making prayer wheels with um, ball bearings. Well, no, why not? You know, so, but big prayer wheels usually are, are still popular, like um, Land of Medicine Buddha has a huge prayer wheel, and then you kind of have to turn it, and then Dona uh, no, um, Zana Bazaar has like kind of a prayer wheel kind of shrine fence, and you just kind of it's very physical, you know. I think the body and mind need to work together, so it feels like a dance. It disappeared. Yes, uh, I think I think the copper apparel went the way of um, catalytic converters. <laughs> so, or I hope somebody got their little bump of meth off of it or something. Yes, reality. Yeah. So we. <laughs> so. Yeah, so if we get some more prayer wheels, you know, that there is a way to kind of lock them down, make it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So um, there, there's the biographies of uh, Machik, um, you know, uh, written in what's called Namtar, liberation story style which are uh, useful to read. Um, I want to point out, though, that we have to read them with a certain perspective. Um, the classically, even Yeshit Sogil's Padmasambhava's Buddhist Life Story course written, um, they're, they're written like traditional Western saint stories, which is neat, but it's a problem because it looks like everything's divinely ordained and they just go from one success to another. You know, like even when there's an obstacle, they, they overcome it. So they're unrelentingly positive. Um, and they're meant to like inspire faith and so forth and give, you know, an idealistic view. But uh, when uh, we're actually looking at a teacher's life, um, you shouldn't look at it that way. So because in everyone's life, uh, it, there's going to be setbacks, right? There's going to be losses and failures, right? You know, not everything's dissolved into, you know, Mahamudra. There's still our karmic situation, right? So um, uh, that's why I've, I've told Sabrina, like, I don't, I don't know how my funeral will be, but please attend and tell them what I'm really like. <laughs> like that. Because, um, you know, uh, we, we don't have any, you know, if we're really doing Zobchen, Zobchenpas, or we're doing, really being Chipas, uh, we have nothing to hide, you know? You know, we can say, yes, I'm still, you know, doing this, or I still have this regret, you know? Or some things will always be kind of sad, won't they? You know, I'm not gonna say, yeah, I just transformed everything, you know? Uh, so there, there's still difficulties. So we know Machik had difficulties because she had we're not with different biographies, but she had somewhere between three and five children. One of them was a thief, actually. <laughs> so you you know there was stuff to deal with, kids, right? You know that, and she also had various lovers, right? And um, you know, uh, you know, didn't didn't have conventional marriages and. Um, you know, those, those, you know, those moved on. It, it, you know, in the biographies, it always looks like, well, that she realized everything she could then and moved on and moved on and moved on. Um, also, when I'm reading Sol Trim's biography, very long on her Taramandal website, you know, first married this person, this person, this person, um, and, you know, ending up where she is, which is wonderful, but uh, I'm sure there's still some sadness and grief there. So, you know, because not everything was great, right? You know, so sometimes we celebrate like, oh, then we call, oh, this person was a consort, that person was a consort. So it makes it look like everything was meant to be, everything was planned, everything was great and juicy. That's not, that's not real dharma. Because no, if I sat down with um, Sultra, you know, I was, you know, have my therapist hat on. We, we would, I would know, like, okay, this, this stuff, right? 
come on, you know, it's like, you know, somebody asked me, well, was your divorce a good thing? I said, no, no, it wasn't a good thing. You know, well, maybe it made you practice Dharma more. I'd say, well, I did practice Dharma more, but I wish I had practiced Dharma more without doing that, right? It's, the suffering is not necessary. You know, this is not, you know, uh, you know, if you get a speck in your eye, you know, from the wind, it's been windy lately, you shouldn't be saying, what do I have to learn from this? <laughs> So we, we want to, to overcome real dukkha, real suffering based on delusions, based on the karma you create from delusions right away. We're not saying, please suffer a few more years and then... <laughs> so there's, there's no need to like, uh, from my side anyway, there's no need to like say it's a natural progression. Uh, real mahasiddhas, uh, like they're failures and there's disappointments and you go forward into the unknown, you're not going forward like, I know exactly what's gonna happen next, and it's just a magical display. It's not like that at all. You know, so, you know, like, please don't study with teachers like that, you know, because then you'll think, that's how I'm supposed to live my life. And then you'll end up doing a spiritual override. Well, I, you know, I'm sad about this, but I shouldn't be sad because I'm the Bodhisattva, I should be generating bodhicitta, so I shouldn't be sad, and it's all for the best, and no, come on. Right. So we know we have, you know, horrible tragedy in Buffalo, right? No, no one's going to approach the families and say, you know, the, you know, it's impermanence, it's all for the best. No one's going to say that. No one's going to say, well, maybe this way you'll, you know, practice harder. No one would say that. Who would say that, right? Nobody who has any compassion or insight at all. So just being on the planet, just having the five skandhas, that's suffering or not enough you don't need it anymore you don't need to kind of like okay i'm looking for suffering so i can grow more and get more inspired in my practice no so uh you know i think uh, i'm pretty sure like much glover and didn't look at that way anyway you know she wouldn't have said well i have to go through all this struggle to realize mahamudra you know uh we don't want you to go through a whole bunch of struggle we're here to save you time right we don't want you to struggle like we want to be easy, right? <laughs> Enjoy, right? Like that, you know, still be a benefit to others, but you know, not that uh, uh, there's no, uh, there's no expiation. There's no expiation through punishment, right? We're not meant to be savior beings. We wake up and then we do, we have to still work through karmic causes and conditions. We just have to work with karmic causes and conditions, right? So, uh, this was really inspiring about you know, Majjit Labran and, and Yeshit Sogil and Padmasambhava and all other great teachers. They worked with their current situation and uh, made the best of it and, and taught like that. So uh, now a question. All right. So Roma, I was wondering if there's any uh, written record or evidence as to why she made this practice. That, like, specifically, did she make it for her to overcome her own obstacles and her own challenges, or was it for a student or someone she knew? Um, I'd, I'd have to reread, you know, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, Lama Sarah Harding, who's mostly a translator now in Boulder, I don't think she's, you know, I don't know what, if she has a sangha, but uh, she translated one of the biographies. Um, uh, you know, I would say it probably arose out of her visionary world, you know, because she was a, um, uh, started out as a uh, Prajnaparamita text reciter. Uh, in Asia, not just Tibet, but um, householders would um, gain merit and by sponsoring people to come to their house and, and read Dharma, right? And uh, she specialized in reading, you know, 25,000 line uh, Prajnaparamita and 8,000, of course, Heart Sutra. And she was a speed person. <laughs> so she could read really fast and they could do more and so forth. So probably at some point she went, um, she encountered uh, either a Dakini or 
and she did encounter teachers who said, well, that's really great. You're reading Prajnaparamita, but do you, do you really know the meaning of Prajnaparamita? But, uh, it always has to be meeting people halfway. You see, it's never like the teacher just pours water into your empty head, you know? Uh, you know, you, you, it, you always have to meet halfway. So I'm sure she um, had her creativity and active imagination uh, present and uh, said, how can I do, you know, like it came up in her own meditations, but it was uh, through dialogue with other teachers and herself. Yeah. I mean, there, there are other, um, I mean, it is in the tantric environment to, um, you know, make offerings, of course, and, you know, boil things and um, the, the, these elements were already there, but um, she, um, uh, you know, welded the sutra and tantric teachings and the Mahamudra teachings together in a very unique way. You know, so, so like that, she synthesized them. But you, if you want to read like uh, Sarah Harding's translation, you might pick up on that. Yeah, good question. I guess we could take other comments or complaints or questions. Well, okay. Wilma, you, you, you know that. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dirk. Go, OK, you, you, uh, you know this is one of my heart practices. And, yeah. uh, recently, uh, Mama Sarah, uh, Sarah Harding translated uh, a book called Chud. It's the uh, from the lineage, what is it? The Precious Lineage of Practice Instructions by Jangan Control. Uh -huh. Now, you know, I, I, I received the empowerment for Chud from Chagdhar Rinpoche, did retreats around it and with uh, Dijan Rinpoche's secretary, Lopan Nikula, and the lineage holder of, of the Dujan Terser Chud. Chud, which is Sangye Khandro, not the not the not the Galupa Sangye Khandro, but yeah. <laughs> the translator. And uh, all of that time, I thought that I, I always thought that the visualization was the and the playing of the instruments and the reciting of the text and all of that was the central aspect of the practice. But that translation that Sarah Harding did of the practice lineage of text really. Uh, changed my view of the entire practice. Uh, being, cool. uh, yeah, it's it it it's uh, so prajna paramita oriented. Uh, Kemp practiced a lot of chud with Kempo Gurme Trinley too, and he always told me it's prajna paramita. <laughs> <laughs> like I go, oh, okay, why? <laughs> so. <laughs> But it becomes very clear in that new translation that Sarah Harding did, why it is. Anyway, thank you yeah, for talking for about it. Thanks for bringing that up, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I tend to see it, you know, in this kind of a discussion with Derek as, as a real synthesis of Prajnaparamita, Mahamudra, and, and tantric practices. Um, and, and some of the some of the schools, every school has a chip practice now, and, some is more Prajnaparamita oriented than others. Um, Namkai Norbus was was definitely very uh, <laughs> kind of phrase Dzogcheni like that, and um, Maha Yoga style. Yeah, uh, uh, Dujams, of course, is also is also uh, Dzogchen. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> I seem to have trouble talking. Pardon me for interrupting. Not at all. Thank you. Doug, you have a question? Comment? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you wrote about the four demons. And the yeah. first demon, I didn't quite understand, but blocks the senses. Uh, generally, you know, it, blocking means, you know, we're, we're objectifying something. So we're not seeing the senses as process, but it's just um, noticing outside objects. So for those people that are doing the study program with me, I'm, uh, and Elizabeth Zima, hello, uh, then 
uh, we're trying to look at Abhidharma um, uh, as a process, philosophy of process theory, instead of just noticing, um, you know, concrete objects like that. We tend to just see things like, well, I'm in here, they're out there, they're objects in space, you know, and we're not connected and that's that. So that would be the demon of, uh, that blocks the senses in the demon of self and other. And then the other demon is our attachment to pleasurable states. We want to avoid pain and we go after pleasure, just like eight worldly dharmas. Would that include yeah, definitely, definitely objectifying, you know, so um, it really takes a lot of practice not to objectify people and kind of box them in. Good question. Mama, I have a question. Okay. Okay. Um, could like kind of a modern example of like a potential should practice um, of going to the places that scare us be like watching Fox News with like the intention of doing that kind of practice? And I, I, I do, I do mean it uh, seriously. Uh, so of course that's that's possible to do that. That would you know. You know, um, uh, the the point, uh, the hard part about um, watching movies or TVs as a basis uh, sometimes can be like it. It does look weirdly even um, more real. So that that's important, you know. Some because uh, when uh, we're watching TV or, or um, uh, even looking at our devices or movies, we go into a trance state, right? So um, the trance state is different than, um, here I am using a uh, Jungian term, uh, active imagination, where you know you're generating a certain vision of uh, something difficult or horrible. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, it's it's very it's it's tricky. It can be done, you know, like that. So, um, but uh, th this kind of an un unreality piece to uh, uh, video in a way that can both heal and uh, or liberate. This autumn knows, right? You know, can go either way. So. Um, uh, when doing the chip practice or doing any imaginative practice, tantra or anything, um, we have to be really aware that we're in a generation or creation stage practice, that we're still uh, developing that and it's not objective reality. Um, there's also like, I mean, when we even watch terrible things on TV or movies, this is a kind of distance. Um, so, the tendency is to um, numb out a little bit or trance state. So when doing active imagination, doing uh, Kairim practice, you know, um, you actually want to feel it in your body, you know, like that. So um, where you're, you're generating such a strong visualization that, you know, you're feeling it. So, you know, and then when we talk about doing the Salon practice, you want to feel like you have uh, a channel where the air can go up and down and everything, you know, it's like a felt sense, not just doing it. So that, that's the tricky part. Um, uh, and uh, the, the traditional demons um, in the chip practice, uh, even though they correspond, you know, uh, the imaginative visualized side correspond with actual mental states. Um, there's still kind of a practice piece that goes with that. Like it's still has an aspect of, um, we still have our training wheels on. Whereas if we directly are working with horrible situations and are 
our um, meditative practice is still young, um, we can become uh, traumatized, right? It's a real thing. So of course we can do that, um, but generally, um, uh, I'd say watching Fox News would be like generating anger. <laughs> Is that why you're watching Fox News to generate anger, or you're just uh... yes, no? Yeah, I think yeah to understand it, and um, yeah, just get a sense of like kind of what does that demon need? What are these you know people who are overwhelmed by anger? You know what is the need? and how it manifests in myself too um that's a little bit of problem because then we have already the demon of there's other people so when doing a chip practice you you really don't have you know you're not objectifying and saying there are these idiots that are act like demons and i'm gonna you know let them chop up my body or something so the the chip practice needs to day generally on uh, this deep imaginal level which is still a felt sense but it is not like how could, how could that person white supremacist do this i need you know i'll work with the anger about him that that's um that would be tricky to do it from a chip point of view actually you, you want to work just with your own feelings um like that not try to operationalize it directly what do you think good question thank you yeah, yeah th thank you for that appreciate it so yeah you know I, i've done a lot i appreciate uh uh dirk um speaking up you know i've done a number of chin impairments through all the lineages and it, it, it uh, helped me a lot from a therapeutic point of view, you know, working through single parenting and divorce and, you know, working in inpatient hospitals with people killing themselves and assault and everything, right? Really rugged stuff. Uh, but um, uh, it's, it's more than a therapeutic practice. So it has to do with fundamentally changing our sense of identity. So if we use these practices, um, on this, from, you know, letting go style or, you know, amelioration style, like patients, then that's good, but that's, we're not using them to the fullest. We, we're, we're using them to fundamentally change how we think the world works like that. And, and uh, it's a little closer to, it's a little closer to um, Thich Nhat Hanh's poems of, um, the boatman, you know, he, I am the, uh, I am the perpetrator and the victim at the same time. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh's poems are very profound about not objectifying, um, you know, the anger, or the, um, you know, like that. Anybody familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh's poems? Yeah, they're super, you know, so great being. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was a real interesting person, you know, like, uh, this is a little aside, like, um, later in his life, he wrote some love poems that were addressed to a nun, you know, and raised a little eyebrows, you know, and I, yeah, and I don't, I don't, there were more just like, I love you, you know, and um, like, not, uh, you know, just heartfelt, you know, so uh, I'm fortunate, I spent some time with him, so it was very, um, it wasn't seductive or something. It's just, you know, just like, just around loving everybody. You know, that's the plan, right? So we have a few more minutes. Yeah, good turnout today. So thank you for being here, everybody. Hmm. Uh, hi, we need the microphone. Oh. So Lojong has some slogans on feeding the demons. And that was, I don't know history-wise what came first, but is it the same 
kind of um, is it the same kind of practice? You mean like seven point mind training? No, no. Yeah. In in Lojong, yeah. there are there there are a couple of slogans about feeding the demons. Yeah, the seven point mind training is a Lojong text. Yeah, so you mean like? Oh, this, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Um, uh, I think it's very similar. Yes, that's a good question. Um, but that uh, seven point mind training is generally kept within uh you know it's not using um so much uh tantric imagery and you know skulls and <laughs> chopping up your body and bikinis and stuff like that but and i mean in tibet um maybe until recent i mean it, like beings and spirits and demons were just part of the myth you know part of the world so um my own teacher uh uh Kishio John uh if there was a problem he would uh like me say, oh, how are you doing? And I go, I'm not feeling that good. Then the first thing would be actually kind of medical. Oh, you know, what did you eat? <laughs> like that. And then uh the second one would be um, you know generating some mind you know afflicted emotion but you don't feel good because you just got angry and i said no no actually you know believe it or not i wasn't angry today and <laughs> and then the third one would be you know <laughs> the third one would be karma like maybe you know is, is there some past uh karmic condition that's coming to fruition right and i might go god i can't think of anything then it would go, oh, then that's the dawn. So that would be a demon, right? So I don't know, like Don Giovanni. <laughs> the dawn, like like just kind of generic. They're all Mara, Amara. Yeah, Amara. So like you go, oh, well now what? <laughs> um, so it's interesting. So we would change from a very rational the so-called rational world, scientific cause and effect world, to, okay, I'm gonna come over or come down here and I'll do a puja for you. And um, he was a master at doing elaborate healing ceremonies and, and then I'd feel better. Maybe it was the attention, maybe it was just, you know, <laughs> but that's how, that's very classical. You know, you first look, okay, medical, then your humors are out of sync, and then maybe it's, uh, you know, some obstacle, just regular old clashes, and then sometimes it's karmic. And if it's not that, then it has to be, you know, you've, um, you have to make some offerings. Uh, usually, is this a little off subject or is this interesting? But I don't know. So um, with a lot of things, like it's the Nagas, the snakes, snake beings. So Nagas uh, are like, mermen and mermaids, right? And they have um, well, a lot of things, you know, around um, the earth and the water and stuff like that. So then you'd have to make um, sometimes some offerings to the Nagas. So then uh, Lama Kunga in uh, uh, East Bay used to make a lot of uh, treasure vases. So you could make, you could get a treasure vase and then Put it in, in uh, do some practices and bury in your land, and sometimes which would have jewels and different things in it, and um, then uh, that you wouldn't be sick. It worked. So that's the wonderful thing about kind of magic, like you know, like well, if all else fails, you know, then you do that. <laughs> so The things have like yeah so things have um uh you know to practice has a, a magical quality to it for sure yeah this is a lot different than just talking about being mindful and letting go <laughs> but i hope this is helpful to some people mm.
Lama. Um, sorry, I can't tell if someone else is talking in the temple. We will in a minute. You have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering how would one get started with this type of practice? Um, do we, we talk with you first? Don't get started. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, laying out this is one one practice, you know, like just building foundation. Like this doesn't mean, okay, you guys go out and do this right away. Yeah. You know, so there, there are many practices in our tradition, like many tools in the toolbox, but you can't use them all at the same time. You know, it's just impossible. It's not even necessary. They're just developed as skillful means, you know, to meet people halfway with their interest and their particular you know, style or Buddha family like that. So it isn't like, oh my gosh, now I gotta do this. You know, we can have the same approach uh, just doing our uh, Zogchen practice, right? So Zogchen practice, you know, it's just kind of like, okay, bring it on, I'll just eat it up, right? Your experience, like, just, just bring it on. You don't have to, like, uh, you don't have to do any visualization at all. How about just, you know, like Dingo can say yourself, say just, you know, just be open to everything. <laughs> You'd hear him talk and go, easy for you, you know, but he was, you know, he was open to it, just open. How about being completely transparent and open? Huh? Does that sound too much? No, yeah, good. So that's no, that's the that's the ultimate practice. Okay, so maybe this is a good advertisement for we need new microphones. How's that? Anyway, go ahead. It's supposed to be green. Okay. Yeah. Um, going back to the first demon, mm -hmm. um, you're talking about blocking. Is it blocking yourself from others or perhaps yourself from yourself? How does that? It's really a cognitive blocking. You know, so it looks like there are objects out there. I mean, we don't even notice it. We've just, it just, we just do it. You know, it's just, it just feels like there are objects in space out there. It feels like that to me. It doesn't feel like that to you. Yeah. So it's hard to recognize that that actually is our construct. The hard part about Buddha Dharma is that. Um, we're, we're, we're pointing out normal ways of perception, right? The same way anybody would. And we're saying that these are not entirely veridical, that things don't actually exist the way they usually appear. And we're also saying that generally you need uh, some specialized training to realize this. So it, it, it's always going to have a certain kind of um, elitist view because uh, you know, people have to have some kind of insight that, yeah, things don't appear the way they really are, or they didn't turn out the way I thought they would, or, um, and then you have to be curious, like, why is that so? And then you have to be willing to kind of, you know, use your electron microscope. Because it's not immediately obvious that, that things um, uh, don't operate the way they appear. Otherwise, everyone would just go, yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have to do all this. It would be nice. Is that, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Yeah, it, it's, so, it's so automatic like that. And Mike has a hand up in the back. So thank you for those sitting on cushions if, yours, if your knees are killing you or not, but. Is there a current manifestation of Maji right now? So, um, you know, a few different teachers, you know, recognize, you know, Lama Sultan like that. You know, so, um, once again, that doesn't mean like solid thing, you know, it's like, um, it, it's, it's wonderful when uh, you know we can say, "Oh, that person consistently is embodying those qualities." But um, you know, we we don't have a, 
it's not like a published, you know, uh, you know, recognizing someone's qualities, teachers recognizing other teachers' qualities is kind of a tribal thing, right? You know, it's it's not quite the same as, you know, getting a diploma like, like that. Uh, well, she studied with different teachers, studied with Trump Rinpoche, like I did, studied with Melkai Norbu Rinpoche, like I did, and, and a number of other teachers. Um, um, I think she studied with a number of different teachers, you know. Um, the, I'm going to give my quick talk on um, we, we tend to look things through Western Christian ideas, you know, around Protestant, Baptist, Catholic, Roman, you know, Orthodox. Um, but uh, the way it historically was is more like around monasteries and following individual teachers that you could generally group under some terms. But many monasteries and definitely uh, you know, monasteries uh, now, particularly in Nepal, you know, we're going to have do a variety of different practices. So, um, uh, you know, it's uh, um, it's more like a uh, um, current uh, practice to deal with depression is. Um, uh, TM, TMS, you know, where the magnets, you know. So is that a medical practice or a psychological practice, right? Because you're dealing with depression, you know. So when we say Kargu and Nyingma or Geluk, or we have to be careful that um, many people have, you know, cross-practiced in different traditions, and I'm sure she did, and just as I have like that. At some point, if you want everyone to do the same thing, when, and not be all cacophony, you, you want to be reading out the same things at the same time. But that's some, you know, um, most, most of the teachers that I studied with were very familiar and have done teachings through all the lineages now. Good question. So, okay. John is, yeah, last one. So, <clears throat> Thanks, Lama. Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts with this one. It it, it seems in a way, um, they, they, first of all, the guy you mentioned, the Zen guy from San Francisco who went to, I think he went to Auschwitz also and did that same practice. Is that correct? Uh, uh, Bernie, yeah. yeah. He wasn't from San Francisco, but LA. Oh, yeah. That's and, right. He did. And I think it reminds me what you said in response to Jack's question. Um, it reminded me a little bit of, remember the Lama who came and told us, we're always doing analytical meditation. We, we don't realize it you know, when we go to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, um, that's and, right. And maybe it's not quite the same thing with this. Like, we're not, we're not always doing this, but it seems like, and I look back in my life and I've had situations like, kind of like Bernie's in Auschwitz. I was in Rwanda once for work, and um, after a week of uh, no working with people, they came and told me, because everyone who's, who's still living there has, all has crazy stories and hit me so hard um, when they all told me the stories about seeing their families slaughtered in front of their eyes and everything and um and i remember coming back to my hotel hotel rwanda actually <laughs> um, wow. and just like wanting to meditate for the rest of the day and, and um and i remember writing my zen teacher about it and he's like well you should you know get help and <laughs> calm down and i was like no it was actually i felt like it was a really good thing uh -huh. to be exposed to this is going on. We see it on the TV, but it doesn't mm. register. It's very like out there, and it does. It's very conceptual, and I think a lot of stuff that I read is conceptual, and things in my head are conceptual. It's not until I have the direct kind of experience of getting to know people, and they have these, and they can tell me. You know, I saw my family slaughtered, but mm. that maybe it's it's like grist, and I don't know if that's exactly what this teacher is speaking to, but it, it, it like it made it very powerful and. Um, and it's all my fears. And it wasn't something about how horrible people could be. It was yeah. like, this is something I could yeah. all be wrapped up in this. 
think our country is becoming a little bit Rwanda as mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a little bit uh, question common. <laughs> yeah, good, good points. Um, when and doing the pra all the practices, whether it's shamatha or lojong or anything, you, you, you want to practice to the edge where you're being whelmed, but not overwhelmed, because that's trauma, then you're just re traumatizing yourself. So, um, you know, we, we have to be very sensitive to our system. So now, so, you know, be 69 and, you know, still pretty, you know, energized, but I do not want to do inpatient lockdown psychiatric facilities anymore. Just not down for that. Enough. I've done it. You know, that, that's really hard work. And I know that I would be much more tired and I wouldn't be able to do this. I'd be wiped. I was wiped, you know, doing it 20 years ago. So I wouldn't, I'm not, not going to do that, you know, that would just, you know, like, that would probably be, I, I would survive, but it would be probably overwhelming for my system at my age and, you know, like that. You don't, you don't see a lot of old people working real locked psych facilities. Because it's just too much. So that would be overwhelming. I, I wouldn't say, well, great, I'm doing my chip practice because I'm at Crestwood or I'm not going to the prison anymore, you know, I'm not being shot at. You know, so um, you know, <laughs> a lesser things right now, you know, well me so I don't have to like, I don't have to go. <laughs> you guys well me so I don't have to, you know, I don't have to push it any further, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm getting smarter too. I don't, you know, to feel the edge there between the known and the unknown. I don't have to like push the edge of the envelope so far. So, yeah, there's no reason to be. Uh, but if we are in horrific situations, um, which in general is samsara, you know, the, the Dharma practices uh, are incredible ways to overcome trauma. You know, that's really overcoming samsara so that. Uh, we're still going to be well, we're still going to feel it, right? You know, sad situations are always going to be sad. Difficult situations are always going to be difficult. But uh, we can maintain our bodhicitta and, and we can be of benefit, right? So uh, I've seen that in my life and other incredible people here. So, um, uh, you know, like, you know, they, they all have, uh, they all have a safe life. It's, we're, we're already, we've already had overwhelm, right? So I'm going to take it down. Okay, so we should do our closing prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, actions, may I quickly attain the state, state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. state. May the Supreme Angel Jewel Bodhicitta that, that has not arisen and rise and grow. grow. May that, that which has arisen not diminish, but, but increase more and more. In the land and encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful generosity, Tendin Jato, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrants achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losar, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great, great treasure of optimist compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Songkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Well, Sandrapa, Sandrapa, I make requests request at your holy feet. feet. So thank you for today. I'll still be here this afternoon. Uh, enjoy full moon. Thank you, Dirk, for doing full. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just going first. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so thank you so much, Dark. And now Susan has some announcements. Yeah. Oh, you don't? Okay, Autumn does, yeah.
Okay, so um, I am the point person for the Sakadawa Buddha's birthday celebration on June 12th. Never done this before, so getting lots of support. And um, we definitely need you guys to help as well. We've got a potluck, which Kathy M and Jules are. Uh, see them if you want to help with the food. And see me if you want to help with any setup or all these things on this list. <laughs> and that is all from me. Thank, thank you, Autumn. And um, so I think it's going to be fantastic with you as our lead. I really do. So. Or um, maybe everyone's still aware that um, this will be uh, Montag's last Sunday with us for quite a while. So, um, you know, we already said goodbye to him, so you don't have to get, you know, all teary, but if you like, um, <laughs> you will see him. <laughs> uh, I'll also like to say Greg Self's going to visit Kansarimshe in June, right? So that's really wonderful. Um, Kansarim Shea here has visited uh, several times and, um, you know, I, I'm always saying to Jules and Greg, like, uh, invite him again <laughs> to Sacramento, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, we'll work it out. So that's wonderful that you're going to, um, and in Nepal, you know, traveling. Um, you know, still, you know, uh, something that takes energy and um, planning and time and um, I'm very committed to, you know, keeping in touch with, uh, you know, Asian roots and, um, you know, the, having that real friendship model. So for both of you, you know, I'm delighted. <laughs> it's good. Okay. Ciao.